Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to our second webinar of this year. I'm Zuhana Adam, librarian at the National Library. I would be moderating today's webinar. Before we go any further with the webinar, I would like to give a few house housekeeping announcements. Duration of this se session is 40 minutes and this meeting is being recorded. All participants, please mute your mics and off cameras during the presentation to avoid distractions. We will put a link in the chat to mark the attendance. Please fill the attendance before the end of the session. E-certificates will be sent to those participants who complete the evaluation form. The evaluation form will be posted in the chat box at the end of the presentation. Many thanks to Dr. Zina for all the kind help given to the National Library to make this webinar session a uh, series to happen. Dr. Zina is an independent LIS researcher from Singapore. The floor will be open for questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, topics for today's webinar is deconstructing library instructions, engaging strategies and innovative approaches. As we all know, librarians, we have the responsibility to engage, lead and act in ensuring our students to develop critical thinking skills and knowledge practices using innovative instructional strategies. We are very pleased to welcome Ms. Aditi Gupta, engineering and science librarian at the University of Victoria uh, Libraries, Canada. She received her Master's of Library and Information Science from the University of British Columbia in 2004 and, his and has worked in the libraries for over 18 years. Aditi's research interests include diversity and inclusion in libraries, inclusive teaching practices, information literacy instructions, um, and information-seeking behavior of visible minorities, international students and multicultural populations. As also Ms. Aditi is an active member of American Library Association. Without any further ado, I kindly request Ms. Aditi to give the presentation. Thanks so much, Chazal, for introducing me. Um, I think you did a great job. Um, uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, my name is Aditi, like um, Girl has mentioned here, but I wouldn't be here without Dr. Gina's help. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, if you are listening, <laughs> Gina, I know you're here somewhere. So thank you so much for having me today. I know we have... Um, less time than usual and I know you all have a very busy schedule as well so I will start off by just saying a few things about where I come from but before that I want to know where you come from so I am going to put in the chat um, or at least here on the screen you will notice that um, I have put in two to three things that I'm asking you to introduce yourselves about if you have access to a computer or if you're on a smartphone or any kind of device that you're using today and have access to the chat uh, put in your name the name of your library and your role at the library so I'll do that as well my name is Aditi and I come from the University of Victoria Libraries and I'm the engineering and science librarian there. Oh, I already see someone's posted. Thank you so much, Majita. And uh, while I'm actually introducing myself, I will also uh, continue to monitor the chat if I have uh, if I have the time, and I might actually uh, at some point pause and just look at everyone's um, names here. Wow. Okay. Most of you are from the national libraries, I see, but thank you so much for posting that. So please continue to put in your names and where you're uh, joining us from today. Um, honestly, I haven't been to the Maldives, so it is on my to-do list. Uh, once in my lifetime, I hope I can actually visit the national library sometime in my lifetime. So thank you for all, to all of the organizers, but also thank you for joining me today. Um, Today, I'll be talking about a few things. So the outline of today's agenda will include a brief introduction of what information literacy means. 
Um, that word, I think, or these two words, I think you probably as librarians heard about it a lot. Some of you might be familiar with it too. It's used in uh, various contexts at the university level, school level, and so on. Even public libraries now uh, in North America are adapting that, um, you know, these terms. Um, I'll also discuss briefly about digital information fluency what that means uh, in terms of how we introduced it at our library at least. Uh, frameworks for information literacy, I won't go into much details, but I'll at least let you know what I use for my own work uh, and what the frameworks mean, like in terms of librarianship, how we can use some of them or what they mean. Um, I'll also uh, introduce you to some of the steps I use as a librarian at my university to plan an instruction session. So if uh, someone has approached me like an instructor or a faculty member to go into their classrooms, what are some of the steps that I take? Um, finally, we'll discuss two things. One I'll show you is what kind of activities I do with students. We often find that students get disengaged when they hear the name libraries and it's very universal. It's not only in Canada or the States or you know, here where I am traveling right now to India, I've seen that as well. So what can we do to in fact engage them in the classroom or wherever you are working right now? If you're doing an activity with students, how you can achieve that um, or engage with them. And then I'll also talk a little bit about surveys. So I think it's important to uh, measure what we do, not in terms of how many people came or you know, how many, um, what our numbers were, but in terms of what they learned. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the very end as well. So uh, where am I located? Um, as I put into the chat, um, the University of Victoria actually sits on indigenous lands. Uh, most of Canada is now in a phase of reconciliation. Um, in the past, when colo the colonies or the col colonial systems existed, a lot of our indigenous communities were impacted. So uh, because of that, uh, you know, a lot of our indigenous communities now are getting reconciled in the sense we are issuing apologies all across Canada. The University of Victoria actually stands on the traditional lands of the Tsongis, Esquimalt and the Vasanic peoples. And I have the privilege of working there. I am a settler, so I'm originally from India. I grew up in the Western part of India. Um, and then travel to BC to do my degree. And now I live on an island. So um, the island uh, is actually Vancouver Island. And as you can see on the screen, Victoria is only accessible by ferries, uh, either to the States and Seattle is the closest location to us or the Loma mainland Vancouver. So just to give you con some context about where I work and where I live. Um, that is basically the university, the round ring that you see, that is the ring road for uh, the University of Victoria, and it's in a circle that uh, the university lies, so it's just an aerial view of the university there. And um, whom do we serve? So at the libraries, we have around 100, and I think we've gone down a bit in staff or since COVID, I think we've had a few retirements. Uh, but I think we're roughly around the same, say around one, I would say 140 to 140, 150 like, uh, staff members. Uh, we have about 33 librarians right now. And some of the stats in here, I won't read all of them, but when I share my slides, you can definitely see some of the information there. We have roughly between 20 to 22,000 full-time students. And these are both undergraduate and graduate or slash postgraduate, however you refer to them. Um, most of these students uh, will come into campus every day because we've been open since September for our face-to-face -face instruction sessions now. Uh, we were shut down since 2020, but most of our instruction sessions either take place in person in the library. So we do have two designated rooms for library instruction and, um, or we actually go into the classrooms or we conduct them over Zoom, whatever the preference is right now. Um, so moving on to what information literacy is, you'll notice that, you know, since the mid 90s, 2000s, the word bibliographic instruction was used heavily, which also meant that we were helping users to find and locate information. Um, mostly this was using our catalogs or using our, you know, online catalogs, perhaps. 
So information literacy is kind of a derivative of that where it is an ability to recognize when information is needed and to locate, evaluate, and use effectively, effectively the needed information. This was coined by the American Library Association in 1989, and it hasn't changed much. Most of the librarians still call it information literacy instruction, and that's how it, it should be actually recognized because it's a very crucial and important, I think, terminology, but also concept. So information literacy can take various forms. So for example, in public libraries, librarians will offer instruction sessions to their users in terms of using um, you know, computers. Sometimes school librarians will do that too. They will actually help or assist students to do uh, their research in the library or come into the library to find books or textbooks or material for whatever they are studying. Uh, in the university system, we kind of use it for coursework. So when a faculty member comes into the library and tells us that they want an instruction session for say engineering students, then I will just offer um, you know, uh, an information literacy session designed to help students to find and locate information. What I've done a little bit with this is uh, I've gone a little further to teach them how to actually sift through all the information they find. Because right now we have an information overload, as we all know, especially with the, you know, with the advent of the internet and web services, it's very confusing. So why teach information literacy skills? I think I said that a little bit, but obviously the digital landscape has, so, has given us so much exposure. Imagine students, they're already working with uh, digital resources through their phones, through technology, they're surrounded by information. However, ask the student whether or not this information is you know, scholarly or in the sense, like can it be used for academic purposes? or for school purposes or for their research, and they don't know because they have so much information at their disposal. So like, as librarians, I believe we can critically help them to evaluate the information, whether it's accurate, so it's not fake news, so that it's credible, who's written it, so that it comes from somebody who's, uh, who's basically known to them or someone who has an expertise in the area. And then obviously, you know, as librarians, I think we can teach students to intentionally and purposefully find material. So what is the intention of the actual resource that they have found? What is the purpose that it was written for? So these are important questions. And then finally, I think, at least at the level of university resources, we, we feel, and even I think at level of the schools, it's important to teach students right from the very start that if they find information somewhere, they have to give credit to the person who has created that information. So, do, uh, so do, we kind of do not tell them that you are cheating or anything, but we do in a very mild way say, these are not your thoughts. These are originally not your you know, original um, writings. So you have to give people who have created this information enough credit. That's what we teach students. Um, and that can be in many forms. At the University of Victoria Libraries, we teach students digital information skills. Now, and these we call them as digital information fluency. So we've become a little more complicated in this. The reason we use fluency as the term rather than information fluency, we changed it to digital fluency. So information you know, comes in various forms and contexts. But we find that students already coming from high school or even just being, you know, my daughter is seven years old. She knows how to use a smartphone and to find information on Google. It's amazing. At seven years old, I didn't know how to do anything. I knew what the remote looked like perhaps, but I think my parents didn't let me touch it either. So I don't know if you, you feel that way too. So students already know how to find information using Google. So if you are trying to teach them now how to find information using a library's database or something in the catalog, it's not going to sit very well with them because you're conflicting what they already know. So what we tell students is we're basically just trying to give you a few more skills to basically sift through or, you know, find that information effectively, evaluate the information. So make sure that it's not fake news, uh, evaluate the accuracy of anything that they find. And then, you know, obviously use and disseminate. That means spread that information in a very good way. So don't spread information just because you've seen it and it looks really nice. Imagine or 
in fact, think about what the purpose of that information is and whether or not it is really professional or ethical to share that information. So we're just teaching students to tweak what they have found. So um, the skills can be in various forms. It could be in the use of a tool. So for example, using Google or Google Scholar can also be added. Uh, writing and critical think, uh, thinking. So we basically just try to channelize their ways of actually sharing information or communicating ideas in the form of writings. How to write a paper and then how to cite or give credit to somebody. That would be digital information uh, fluency, basically. So just to give you another framework or another model that we are using at our library right now. This comes from ACRL, which is the Association of College and Research Libraries. And this framework basically has these six frames. So they have authorities constructed and contextual, information creation as a process, information has value, research as inquiry, scholarship in, is a conversation and searching is strategic. It looks confusing. It did to me as well when it came out in 2015. What do frameworks do? They just I, allow you to actually teach students concepts like we saw information literacy concepts, but actually channelize those concepts so they're adaptable to their very environment that they're working in. So if they are working in an actual school setting, they are able to find the information, but you use a framework to tell them, so authority, let's find out who this person is who's writing this information, why are they creating this information and so on. So I'll show you what um, this, one of the authors for one of the books where I adapted this from, and I've included that, it's Buchanan. Uh, I've actually included it in the references when the slides come to you, you'll be able to click on or at least find that book. Um, so for example, if I'm going into a classroom and a faculty member tells me my students are writing a paper next week, they do need resources. And I want you to teach them how to find information from scholars who are experts in the field. So scholarly material, as we refer to it. Uh, can you teach them that? What I basically do is I go into the classroom and I talk. And obviously, students are disengaged. They already know what they know. They don't want to learn from me. So then I include an activity. What I basically do is um, I tell them to find a resource and then answer a few questions here. Who are the experts in the field already that you know of? Are they the ones that you found an article from? Can you find something that they have written? How did they become experts? Tell me a bit about the authors. And how do you know whether someone is an expert in a discipline or not? And then they start thinking, oh, you mean like whether they work in a university setting or whether they are like from a, a, an association or that they work like uh, they're the principal of a school, for example, when they come out of grade 12, that's what the questions that they're asking. And I say, yes, can you find out that information? So they have to give me at least two, two answers to three questions, for example. Then, you know, you can use any one of these frames. It's not necessary to use all of them. I just use one in my classroom, so I don't complicate it. Similarly, you know, I use scholarship as a conversation and I ask them in context of whatever they found, can you also tell me, um, do the, all the scholars feel the same way about this topic? Have you seen other articles that conflict this article? kind of agree with this article and that, that's where I leave it. So they're starting to think critically. They, they're kind of starting to imagine what life would be in the context of this article but outside the domain of this article. So just a very brief example there. It looks complicated but as you start using it, it starts becoming a little easier too. And there's a lot of material out there on the websites and stuff that I have included in the links that will give you access to it. So for my library instruction sessions, I um, do a, a few things. I have two rules for my instructors. If they are sending students into my library, it's usually because they're not available to give a class lecture. It's either they're traveling out of class, I mean, off the university, or they have something else that has come up. I usually know that in advance. But if that's the case, I ask them to send in their TAs, so teaching assistants. So is there somebody else who can substitute? So don't send students alone because then they're very disinterested. The second thing is I tell them, tell students that it's mandatory. It's compulsory to attend the library instruction session. These are university students who have the best interest in you know, finishing off their classes, but they also don't necessarily need to attend library instruction sessions. So those are firstly my two rules. Then I meet with the instructor in person and I present this if they're fine with it. 
I asked them to give me whatever students are studying or what they are working on. So some learning outcomes that students are using. Um, I also inquire whether students are going to complete an assignment in subsequent weeks, like following the session, where their current coursework is. I work a little bit on room bookings because we only have two rooms and we have about, um, I think 30 librarians who will uh, try and use those rooms for their instruction sessions, especially at the start of term. And then I ask uh, the faculty members whether they would like me to give them a handout with just five or six, you know, key points that I'm going to cover, or I create what are known as library guides. So we have some software programs that allow us to create a guide. And sometimes I create that if, if they allow me to, or they have an interest in it. Finally, I use some of the activities that I told you, and I have some examples of activities as well. I kind of go into classrooms assuming the students are gonna be bored. So how can I engage them is always my thought. So I leave them with an activity that gives them enough time to reinforce what I have taught them. If I just keep teaching and talking, they will forget. But as they're doing, they start realizing that there is something here that I have taught them that may be applicable to their own work. And mostly these sessions are 50 minutes. If they, these are single sessions, so one shot instruction sessions as we call them, where we just meet that students once in the classroom. And then I don't see them unless they get in touch with me. And then finally, I do a quick survey. So the survey as well, I'll talk a little bit at the end, just a minute or so. But the survey is usually to assess whether they have understood or, or basically to find out whether they understood what I have told them. It's more or less a way to figure out my own instructional skills rather than seeing how the classroom performs. I'm not looking like numbers and stuff. So just to give you an idea there. And this is what my course guide would look like. So I have one for, <coughs> sorry, uh, the civil engineering group that I did a um, session for. This is for Civ 285, which is a library instruction session that I had conducted. And the instructor basically asked if I could create like a library guide. So I put in books, I put some articles in there and I put links to how to find resources. Sorry, I'm just joking up there. <coughs> okay. So finally, this is what I do in my instruction sessions. I talk a little bit about academic resources, like where to find resources. If I have time, I will teach them one or two databases. So I'll teach them one and tell them to use the same techniques for the other databases. <coughs> I also teach them how to use keywords. So for the civil engineering group, I do concrete. I'll, I'll kind of find out what materials they're using and stuff. And I'll just do a quick search on lightweight concrete, for example. And I'll just do a quick search just to see what articles come out and then show them how to refine articles. And then I leave it at that. Then I tell them, why don't you try it out in another database and ask me any questions. So sometimes students will try and do it. Sometimes they won't. Finally, I teach them how to use the right resource for the assignment. So I show them a couple of articles that have come up, why I would choose something, why I wouldn't choose something. And then I give them certain criteria. So this criteria actually is checklists or uh, these are some sort of criteria that already exists, like the five W's. Um, who's published this information? So it's the who, what, when, why, and where. Um, so what is the purpose of this information? Why are you reading this? Like that is the, uh, this thing. Where was it published? Is it published on the internet or so on? So I can use any one of these criteria that I've actually put in and I give them the checklist. And I say, just make sure you answer a few of these questions once you look at an article. See whether or not this criteria can help you determine whether you should use this article for your research or not. And then I tell them to use citations. So make sure you cite somebody. If it is an author like Shakespeare who's written something, you have to give Shakespeare credit for writing that book. You cannot just rephrase it and write. It. That is considered cheating as well, or plagiarism as we call it. And then finally, if, if the faculty member has given me a little more time, then I might do like three questions or a quiz or something at the very end uh, and say, you know, uh, find a book in the library 
find uh, an author whose name, last name starts with this, who's written something on concrete technology or something like that, you know. So that is basically what I do in the classrooms. So as an activity here, this is something that students enjoy quite a bit, especially first year students. This is for citations. They usually don't understand why they need to cite or what they need to cite anywhere. So finally, we give them this. We tell them a statement like, everyone is happy in Maldives at this time. Would you cite that or no? And then they say, no, no, that's just a statement. And I say, okay. Sometimes they say 82% of students age so-and-so, you know, are this, would you cite that? And they say, yeah, that's a fact because someone's done a survey or a research on that. And I say, okay. So that's one activity I do. The other one I do is this one. I ask them to find resources like I mentioned already. So I won't go into this, but basically those are one or two activities I do. Finally, for the surveys, uh, it's important when you are doing something in a classroom to assess, or like I said, to survey the students. What have students learned and how do participants feel about their own learning? So you kind of can have different ways. You ask them two questions at the very end of class, ask them to write it down on a piece of paper, hand it in to you. And that can be done in one minute. So I call it the one minute paper or a survey and stuff. Or before class, you send the uh, instructor like a quick question, ask them, uh, what do students feel about their current level? Like, how do you find out about what they currently know? Ask them some one question or two. And after class, give them another two questions. That's the post survey. And say, what did you learn? Was there anything different that you learned today that you haven't known from before? I think I'm done. I only have this as tips. So remember, if you are like starting out now, that relationships take time to build. So if you have somebody you know from a school level or an instruction level, you can definitely you know, tap into your friends and ask them, can I try this on your students? Collaborating with instructors and faculty is always key. Um, and I would say teachers too. Integrate an activity always because otherwise students can get really bored of you and your you know, uh, work that you're doing. And it's important to give them something to take away in terms of a survey you can probably learn more about the work you are doing as well. So I think I'm done. Uh, these are some of the resources that I'll share with the slides. I'd like to thank you for listening to me today. I'm going to stop sharing and I know we have very little time left. So I'm here for the next five minutes or so to just take questions from everyone. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Aditi, for the insightful and very exciting presentation. Now the floor is open for questions. Anyone? If you have a question, you can write it on the chat. Oh, this. I Put just put my screen. email address there as well, just in case someone is looking to get in touch with me. Uh, you can email me there for any further information, or if you want to, me to share any of my instructional material, I'll be happy to do so as well. Okay, so it seems nobody, nobody has a question. So we're going to end this. This is the very end of the webinar. Thank you, audience. Once again, I would like to thank Dr. Gina for making this webinar happen. And many more thanks to a very knowledgeable presenter, Ms. Aditi. Have a nice day. Stay Thanks safe. So Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gina. Bye. <laughs>